what connects the Biro, the Rubik's Cube, and Zsa, Zsa Gabor? It's Hungary. Connects them all. Uh, Laszlo Biro, um, Erno Rubik, is it Erno Rubik, and uh, Zsa, Zsa Gabor. And they're all Hungarian, or Hungarian, and Hungarian inventions. Today's all about Hungary. Welcome to the uh, to the wine show, Attic Audrey Zarak. Audrey, is a, this isn't me and Audrey. We met at a, an event not so long ago and had an absolute scream. It was very, very amusing. And um, Audrey has this brilliant business, Malux Hungarian Wines and Spirits. Now go and visit them, hungarianwinesandspirits.com. Now Audrey um, has picked up this business. Now it was started by your father, wasn't it? Lucian, who came to London in the 50s from Hungary. He started a very successful textiles business, got into wine, started to import some of these wines. Audrey's taken it over after a career. I remember you telling me this at the dinner. Was it in California? You had a very successful career and then you came back to the UK and has picked up the reins and has been supplying lots of restaurants. Now this is one of these areas where the wine trade is having to shift because she's been supplying pied a terre and the Fat Duck, really, really first class restaurants. These are the sort of wines you would get in the Fat Duck in Bray, but of course it's shut. So now for the first time you can go and buy them from Hungarian Wines and Spirits. So it's a bit like, I mean, the way to think about these, a little bit premium, but rather than going out to a restaurant and spending, I don't know, 50 quid or something, 60 quid, more even, um, I'm the sommelier, evening madam, evening sir, a very good choice if you don't mind me saying so, and you get to go and enjoy these great wines in your own home. So cook something really fabulous when you have them. Um, I adore Hungary. I was there earlier on this year. We've got lots of interesting pictures. There's some photographs from uh, when we were across there. I'll sort of drop a few of them in. Uh, but to start with, um, here are a couple that Audrey has sent me of some gorgeous cells. I mean, absolutely beautiful. You take a lot, I think, from a Benedictine monastery, um, all sort of tucked away. But from Magyar, now this is Domen Magyar, how is it? Just Magyar. Tokai, which is where we went to. So we travelled to Tokai uh, when we were filming earlier on this year. Now, bizarre facts here. Tokai is the, the wine, is the only wine to appear in a country's national anthem. However, it's in the Hungarian national anthem, uh, it is also one of the possibly the only wine regions in the world that lies in two countries' borders. Somebody will write in and say, no, you're wrong. I think there's a question around whether the, the, the borders around Macedonia. I think there are some DOPs that lie over there. Maybe in other countries, don't know. But certainly um, there's a bit of Tokai that sits in Slovakia. Slovakia, yeah. Um, because the greater Hungary used to encompass like all of Romania, much more Romania and other places, and it shrunk, so it's only about 30% of its original size, I seem to remember. Now, this is a really interesting quirky one, because this is a ferment. I adore ferment. Um, Caroline Gilby, thank you very much indeed, great MW on the wines of Central East, Eastern Europe. Uh, she once told me it's a half sibling of Riesling, so as I swirl, beautifully aromatic, it's almost Riesling-esque, more than almost actually, it is quite Riesling-esque, but it's a half sibling of Chardonnay. So when I go into a... Hmm. This is surprising on so many levels. It's got more structure, if you like, it's more weight weightier wine than Riesling. But this is an off-dry ferment. So there's a sort of a sweetness to it. Lots of you, hello, have been writing in saying, I like wines that got a little bit of sweetness. This, $14.99, is your friend. A brilliant food matching kind of wine. Uh, Audrey told me, she said, when she showed this at her portfolio tasting, like loads of people were going, I've got to go and have some of this. It's one of those things, just run, go with me on this. You'll love it. Chill it. Have it outside. You can just quietly drink it. But that touch of sweetness. Give in to it. Don't do that. I think it's like, oh, no, no, I'm only going to drink totally bone dry wines. You will adore this. It'd be really lovely with slightly spicier food as well because it's got that structure. So it's not like Takai Takai, which makes really icky, sticky wines. This is more, I don't know, what would it be? Sort of Spät Laser German Riesling style off dry. And it's beautiful. Mm. This is 2014 as well. It's had a bit of time to the sweetness and the acidity. It's still got this limey acidity, which is quite common in uh, Fulman. It's allowed it to age a little bit. You know, this has got five, six years on it. Oh, I really like that. It's different though. 
it's different. Now, something else that's a little bit different. What you will need to do today, after this, he says, wearing his WSET hat, is to go to our education hub on our website, wineshow.com, because there's going to be interesting new quirky grape varieties, and you need to go to the education hub and sort of get to grips with interesting grape varieties. Hungary is one of the best places in the world to go and do that, actually, because there's slightly unusual grapes, um, and also it's a country that makes its own oak, which I think shows up in here. I'm trying to think, do we have harsh levelu on um, our grape varieties and how to pronounce it? Harsh levelu, oh, I love harsh levelu. I'll leave that on for a little bit. This is uh, 21 pounds. Now, this is also from Megya. Interestingly, Megya in Tokai is arguably one of the best producers of harsh levelu. I'll tell you who taught me that. Oz Clark and Margaret Rand in uh, this book here. Um, grapes and Wines, comprehensive, and they their particular recommendation for harsh levelu. Now here's the one bit of uh, Hungarian you'll ever remember, because it's a famously difficult language that's possibly a little bit, it's um, Uralic, so it's a little bit like Finnish, it's possibly related to Finnish. It smells of linden leaf, you know, like lime blossom. Well, harsh levelu is the Hungarian for linden leaf, because that's what it smells of. So if you get the sort of lime honey, it smells like this. There are some that are much more linden -y than others. This has had some time in Hungarian oak, which takes away some of the top aromatics, but it gives it more structure mm. in the palate. Still really lovely, fresh lime, lemon lime zestiness. That's a seriously classy wine. Long, sits on the palate. It's got a very, well, sometimes it's term slippery acidity, have a sort of slippery acidity that runs through it. Um, it gives it a creaminess. This is quite a delicate style of wine. Big, expensive wine. You mean a big wines? Oh, sorry, expensive wines shouldn't necessarily be big. They should have class and elegance. This is a classy sort of elegant style of wine. If you enjoy creamier, gentler styles of Burgundy, you are going to enjoy this. It's a slightly more aromatic take on that. Um, oh, it's beautiful. There's quite a lot of volcanic soil when you go to Tokai. Hungary is a beautiful country. There's a lot of quite flat stuff as you go across the sort of Budapest plain. And then you suddenly arrive and it rises up. Let's see if we've got some photographs here. It sort of rises up into these beautiful little villages. Um, and there it's more volcanic. And particularly if you get up to Shomlo, which is further up in the country, that's totally volcanic. It's a sort of volcanic plug that's dropped out. And that gives these great more tangy acidity. I did enjoy Hungary. Got to eat out early. All restaurants shut, surprisingly. Also, don't chink your glasses in Hungary. It seems very bad luck. People don't do it anyway. So you, you mustn't go and do that. Uh, and don't say, oh, it looks like Hammersmith Bridge when you see the chain bridge um, in Budapest. They, literally, they do look the same because they were designed by the same guy. Hammersmith Bridge in West London, shut now, um, was a sort of model for the chain bridge in Hungary, in Budapest. But of course, the chain bridge is this enormous national monument of great. But it was the first time I think they bridged the river between the two cities of Buda and Pest across the Danube. Um, Hammersmith Bridge is sort of shut, and it, it's in Hammersmith. We just see it in the boat race. Um, so the comparisons aren't exact, exactly the same culturally. Right, now I'm going to have to work hard to get this one right. Borne Missa, Kek Frankos, Grand Selection. This is a Kek Frankos, which is also the same as uh, Blau Frankish, which you get in other parts of Europe, uh, particularly in Austria. I love Blau Frankish, really, really do. Always reminds me a bit of Vinto. But it's better. It's like classy Vinto. Now, the reason why Kenk Frankos is it's one of the great varieties that goes into bull's blood. And this is from Edgar, which is, I think I've got that right. My guest, my, I have a great friend, uh, Lilla O'Connor. Hello, Lilla. I hope you're watching this. Who will be there. She's Hungarian. And she'll be screaming at the she, And also Sophie Kiss, who is another great friend of mine, who I hope is watching this. And the two of them will be going, no, that's not how you pronounce Edgar. But I think there's an accent on the is on the second e, isn't it? Egg yeah is lovely, and there's this um, little valley, and it's the valley of the beautiful maidens. Is that right? And it's got loads of, of little cellars, and you go in. We visited in the show; you'll be able to see it. Um, and it, it is filled with beautiful maidens as well. But you 
go into all these little wine shops. It's, it's kind of like the opposite of a wine pop up because they've carved all the shops out of caves. So they absolutely didn't pop up unless you count troglodytes a long time ago. Um, but it's a brilliant spot to go and enjoy lots of great different wines, especially Cape Francoche wines and Eggio wines. Spicy, black fruits, Vimto. It's a real kind of melange of different fruits here. What does it say? Um, this area is rich in thermal springs. I do know that Budapest has more thermal springs than anywhere else, any other city in the world. Also, isn't it true Hungary has the second highest number of Olympic medals per capita in the world? Um, even though it's not been in several Olympics, because under the Soviet, it sort of didn't compete several times. £19 this. Now, apparently, this is only made in certain vintages. What vintage have we got here? 2016. That's clearly a very good vintage. Mm. Now, it's named after this guy. I, I, if I can't make this work, I'm sort of talking now to try and cover up the fact that I'm doing this. I filmed um, a guy blowing up, a, shooting a gun in Egea Castle. And apparently this is named after Borna Misha Gergely, who was a, an officer in the Hungarian army famed for his inventive use of explosives. And there's me there mucking about with an inventive use of explosives. So the story we go and cover is about the siege by Suleiman the Magnificent and 100,000 Turks who came in to try and take Edgar, and 10,000, uh, an army of 10,000 Hungarians repelled them, but famously they ate and drank very well in the castle, and they came out and all their beards were all stained with the red wine, and the, uh, they fought so powerfully and so viciously back that um, the Turks convinced that they'd mixed bull's blood into the wine, and that had given them a great deal of strength. There's some larking about on that theme when we do uh, our episode in series three, which is coming up not too long. So this is in th about the sort of 1550s. Yeah. That is a roast lamb kind of wine, I would recommend, or just any kind of feasting. If you are faced with 100,000 uh, invading Ottomans, that's probably the thing to be going and drinking because it would go down very, very well. We forget, the guy told me this, that this is roughly on the same sort of latitude as Burgundy. So when you're thinking what kind of climatic impact it has, it's sort of a bit like uh, being in Burgundy. Um, I've got, I had to write this down because I couldn't get it right. In Finland, bulls, this isn't bull's blood, but in Finland, bull's blood from Edgar is known as Erkin Pikakivari or Erki's automatic rifle. I have no idea why. There's a lot of thing fins, fin, things Finns do for which there is no explanation. If you are Finnish, write in and tell us how much I offended your entire nation. I once sat next to a guy at dinner. It's an awful story. You know, Finns like, don't talk. And if you are Finnish, it's true. Finns literally just don't talk at all. And I sat next to this guy, and if I asked him a question, he would just say yes, no, yes, no. And at the end, I was really weird. Anyway, I drank too much. It was a sake dinner. And I remember saying to him, where do you come from? And right at the end of the dinner, and he said, oh, I come from Finland. And um, this is terrible. I sort of said, oh, I'm, I'm so glad. I thought you were mentally ill. And he turned to me. I thought he was going to punch me. And he says, no, a lot of people say this. He was totally unfazed. He was completely silent the whole way through dinner. Uh, but Finns don't say anything. And... Um, Anyway, I don't know why we got onto Finland. Right, let's get let's go and answer some questions. Um, here we go. So hopefully you like that wine. The red is suitable for vegans. The white is suitable for vegetarians. All the wines come from little family producers who we'd like to be supporting. Audrey, thank you so much for sending these across. I'm so glad I met you at that dinner. Go to WICT Education Hub and learn more about great varieties of the world. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, what's the best technique to open wines with wax on the cork? That's Chris asking for a friend. Yeah, that old chestnut. I'm asking for a friend. What do we have here? This was uh, this is a second bottle, Westwell Pink. So it's an English wine that's been dipped in cork. Often, one of the reasons people do this is not to be sort of fancy, but it's because it's cheaper than getting a, a capsule machine. Because you just dunk it like that. Um, the best technique I've found... You can just sort of go straight through 
and pull it out and you will actually lift the whole thing there. What I sometimes then do is, is just to scrape around the top and have a cigarette lighter. If you have a fag lighter, it'll just stop any crumbs from happening because you'll sort of melt them into the, the wax. So hopefully that's a, a technique and a sort of an answer. How do you open a bottle when you've got a, a bit of wax on the top? Um, that's the one that works for me. Take it straight off, scrape off all the excess and use a fag lighter. Neil Hibbard, how, and now then, how do the three different wines that you taste interact with each other on the palate? Do they affect the taste? Neil, it's a very good question. You'll notice that what I tend to do is to build in scale and size. So you tend to try and find the lightest one first, and then the next sort of bigger one, more acidity, whatever, will not be affected by the way your palate was. Now it does change, it's absolutely true. Certainly sort of leaving reds to the end. Interestingly though, it's possibly less so than you think. Uh, I learned this off Jancis Robinson. If you may be watching, hello Jancis if you're watching. Jancis often tastes wines reds first and white second with a little bit of a pause. So if you go to trade tastings, there's like hundreds of wines to get through. Um, and I thought this was some very smart technique until she told me it was just so that you don't go away with black teeth. Because if you've tasted like a hundred reds, your teeth are all black. But then if you're going to taste a hundred whites, a bit like spilling wine on the carpet, it cleans them all up. And so you go away with nice white teeth. So I tend to go and taste, at professional tastings, reds first, white, reds first, white second, and it sort of cleanses your teeth. Um, if you are going and doing a lot of wine tasting, remember, don't brush your teeth for quite a long time afterwards. So if you've been swirling it around, it softens up all the enamel in your mouth. And then uh, they become easy, it, it, they, you can get uh, cavities much more easily if you brush them aggressively, it just takes the enamel off. Top tip there. Go to hungarianwinesandspirits.com for Audrey. Lovely to see you, Audrey. Get yourself some of these wines. Remember, slightly off dry. Anybody's been looking for something a little bit off dry and interesting, that's absolutely fabulous. Delicate, creamy, elegant style of wine. The sort of thing you would find in the flat bar. And a really interesting chunky red, a fruity, um, it's, yeah, it, it's a sort of burgundy, not burgundy, it's burgundy in scale, but I don't know, easier to get into. That's an absolute treat. Now, I don't know if I told you what, how much that one cost. It is £19. Oh, it's brilliant stuff. And then when you can, go and visit Hungary absolutely loved Hungary and read the history of it the most extraordinary history of almost any country in Europe I'd say it's one of the oldest countries in Europe founded by St Stephen which is why everyone's called Istvan isn't it um, and I have a Hungarian cousin Istvan Fatterini I'm not sure he'll be watching he's a young fella but uh, I'm delighted to say there is a Hungarian Fatterini so there's a little bit of me that, uh, that loves Hungary even more Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Come back again on Friday where we've got some treats from Bristol, from Avery's. We'll look forward to going and seeing you then. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.